Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation uh, to the faculty. Uh, what I have prepared, and I hope you can see it, uh, it, it is a little bit light in here in the front. Oh, in the back it doesn't matter, here it is too light. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, well, I've, uh, I will uh, give you a short overview of what we mean by the Roma genocide. And I will start actually uh, the story very early. So I will try to give you a short overview of who the Roma are, how do they come here, uh, when does persecution start. There is lots of elements of the persecution of Roma and Sinti in Europe which are already present before the Nazis come to power. And I will try to show you what these elements are and try to show what the Nazis then actually add to that and uh, end up by uh, presenting the major steps in the persecution of Roma and Sinti. Um, the Roma originally come from north central India. Uh, you have here a small map from a teaching material that was published by the Council of Europe uh, several years ago and they move through Persia and what is nowadays Anatolia and Turkey then towards Byzantium, nowadays Istanbul, which they reach around the year 1000. And uh, here you have a map also from the same teaching material where you can see that uh, around the middle of the 15th century and in the 14th century the Roma pop up in historical documents all over Europe. So how and why do the Roma actually get to Europe? Uh, there is one of these first pictorial illustrations of what the Roma look like from Bern in what is nowadays Switzerland. And uh, we can actually say that the Roma come in two waves, if you want to call it that, into Europe. The first one is with the return of the Crusader armies from the Holy Lands. So when the Crusader states of the Christian uh, nobles in the Holy Land collapse and these Crusaders return to Europe in the 14th and 15th century, the Roma come with them. And the Roma which reach the region north of the Alps will later call themselves Sinti. Why? We don't know. Yeah? But you, you will always see that they are always being referred to as Roma and Sinti. So this is the group which calls themselves Sinti. Yeah? The group that calls themselves Roma come with the second uh, migration during the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah? These usually refer to themselves as Roma. So second expansion of the Ottoman Empire is 1453. Byzantium is occupied by the Turkish armies. The fall of Constantinople, what is nowadays Istanbul. The Battle of Mohaj, 1526 in nowadays Hungary is when the Turkish armies defeat the Christian armies or basically the Hungarian army. And then for 150 years, most parts of Central and Eastern Europe are under Ottoman, that is Turkish rule. 1683, the second siege of Vienna, where the armies are beaten back. And now, why am I telling you this? Because there is a connection there. Why do the Roma come to Europe with these armies? Probably, at least in the second instance, it is because they are experts in firearms. The technology of firearms is not spreading from west to east, it's coming from the east to the west. And this big expansion also of the Ottoman Empire is at least partially explained by the fact that the Ottomans had a more developed firearms, muskets and cannons, than the West. And it took the West about 150 years to catch up with this technology than the Ottoman armies are again being pushed back and probably the Roma were among these gunsmiths who were working and repairing and producing these firearms. Uh, 
the Roma are very often referred to as Zigeuner. You, the, the name crops up in all uh, European languages, Zigani, Zigan, Zinkari. Uh, it comes from a Greek word, Athinganoi, which actually means, if you translate it, the untouchables. Now, this has nothing to do with the caste system of Eastern, uh, of India, uh, but it has to do with the fact that in a few, <coughs> sorry, in the feudal societies, they were a group which were under the direct control of the imperial court. That is, local authorities, provincial authorities could not touch them. Yeah? Untouchable in this way. So it was actually a name of distinction. And this is probably the source of Asinganoi. Uh, our study of the history of the Roma is characterized by a lack of relevant documents. It's very weak. Uh, basis there because there hasn't been a long research into that, only about 30 years. Lack of qualified research, lack of source criticism. Sources are very often interpreted by laymen, stereotype narratives and invented traditions. You probably know what invented traditions are. We can go into that if you want to ask later on. Uh, if we look here at one of the earliest representations of Roma, Jacques Callot, 17th century, then you see this group of people and you see that they are armed, yeah? which is for this time rather unusual. And as long as Europe had an army system which was based on mercenaries, that is paid soldiers, yeah? the Roma were actually in a very good position. When this changes in the 18th century and we have an army raised on the basis of a general levy where everybody is called to arms and has to serve in the army, they sink down very rapidly to the status of beggars, robbers, etc. And they become outcasts. So we have then, when this happens, the 18th century, many provinces start to ban the Roma from their lands. Here is a border plaque, basically, which uh, illustrates the punishments that await the Roma in the county of Styria in Austria if they enter into the land. And the text that you see here is in German, Lost ihr Zigeiner, all hier bleibt keiner aus dem Land, tut weichen, sonst wird man euch ausstreichen. Listen, you gypsies, none of you remain here. Take leave from the country, otherwise you will be whipped out of it. That's what it means. Huh? So you see they lose the status then very quickly. Uh, this change in status we can also see in the visual representation. Huh? In the beginning, st till the beginning of the 19th century, the Roma have a very specialized place in European society, but they have a place in Euro European society. Huh? Like, for example, we see them as musicians. Yeah? This is a very typical representation, a picture of European society, and the Roma have their place there on the left, uh, from your side on the right, sorry. Yeah? Here you can see them as musicians. But you always see them in context. You always see them in the context of European society and of European population and civilization. This will change dramatically in the 19th century. Uh, and Romanticism is the reason for that. Romanticism recasts the European gypsies in the role of the noble savage, the last wild inhabitants of Eastern Europe. Uh, romantic society, so this is the bourgeois society of the European cities. Yeah? They now project all their fantasies, and longings for a easier life yeah, onto the Roma. The Roma live out in the open. They are the children of nature. Uh, they don't have to work regularly. Yeah, and uh, they have this wild love life. Yeah, all these fantasies are being projected onto the Roma. In the beginning, this is uh, actually quite a positive image. Yeah, but the major uh, message, of message of Romanticism is they are not like us and they never will be like us. Huh? 
They are not civilized. You cannot teach them. They will always be different. There is a famous poem uh, by a actually Hungarian poet and which goes together with this painting that you've seen. The painting exists in many, many variations in Central Europe. And this is the poem which actually could have been written according to the painting or maybe the painting was painted after the poem. And in the last verse that you can see here, number seven, yeah? uh, no, number six, which is here, the last one here. Threefold the gypsies revealed the day how when one's life is benighted to sing it, to smoke it, to sleep it away and tries to detest and deride it. This is what you see on the picture. Yeah? They sing, they smoke, they sleep. Yeah? This is the gypsy life. This is the stereotype that we will keep from Romanticism. And this leads to this visu visu visual marginalization. Now, all of a sudden, we, we see them only in the middle of nowhere. Yeah? And this is typical. Yeah? So, you see the gypsy wagon, but there is no, no other populations, no civilization is left. Yeah? The last savages of Europe, and this becomes the standardized depiction. Van Gogh picture of gypsy caravans, yeah? one of the most famous, and again the same kind of setting. Yeah? Uh, and with this goes a moral marginalization. We see Roma in roles which are not typical for the rest of European population. You see them half naked. This is not a picture by Gauguin, although it could be from the style. It is from Tran what is nowadays Transylvania, painted in 96, on the banks of the Samos River. And of course, you see these nude girls, uh, something that you did not see very much at the time. You see uh, a very typical, stereotypical picture here of half-naked naked women. We know actually that these people were paid to get undressed, so they did not run around like this. Yeah? So there is a lot of research into this uh, plein air uh, school of painting, yeah? so impressionist school of painting, and that they had to pay these models to get undressed. Yeah? And all, so we get pictures that are very close to child pornography today, I would say. Uh, now there is another factor which helps to promote this image and it is very important and that is the advent of photography. Photography plays an essential part in establishing how we see the Roma today. Photography is invented in 1826 and starting from the 1850s we have lots and lots of photographs, especially in Central Europe. And it is interesting that the first photographs that are spread all over Europe are very small photographs. They are called actually carte de visite photographs because they are about, you've probably seen them in, in, in some shops, they are not bigger than this, yeah, like a visiting card, and they show photographs. And in the 19th century there is three topics that sell really well. Yeah? The first is kings and queens, so royals. Yeah? The second one is beheadings, yeah? executions of criminals. And the third one is the Roma, yeah? the last savages of Europe. So there is professional photographers, especially in Central mm -hmm. Europe, who discover this and they set up studios. If you look at these photographs, they are all made in studios and they pr 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 provide mostly the clothes, they provide the, the props, as we call it, yeah? for these, many of these photographs. And also the, these people, they get painted now. Here is an example from Hungary. The painter, you can see him here. He is called Lajos Kunfi. He lives in Paris during the winter, where he is famous as Le Peintre des Cigans, the painter of gypsies. And in the summer, he travels to Eastern Europe. He paints gypsies and then he goes back. And many artists do this in the early 20th century. Yeah? You will, if you look at artistic pictures, you will see that this is, the, this is one of his paintings here. Yeah? Also a, a photograph for a, a painting that is later painted in Hungary. But these are arranged pictures and what is interesting here in this series is that 
actually they give a false impression. In 1893, in the Habsburg lands, there is a, a census, a gypsy census. Yeah? And 270,000 Roma are being counted there. And the funny thing is, point A, it's a tiny group. It's only 1.2% of the population of the Habsburg monarchy. Yeah? So we can't say it's a mass problem. Yeah? The second is that 90% of them are settled. They are not moving. Yeah? We have only a tiny minority of maybe 9,000 really wandering gypsies. And out of these 90%, maybe there is another 25 to 30% who are moving seasonally. Uh, for the, during the summer mostly, to, to other places of work, and then they go to their places, to the villages where they live. Uh, but it is the visual representation of this tiny minority which will determine our impression of Roma in the 20th century. Uh, because this is the stereotype that is being established. And so around the turn of the century you have this typical postcard, this is from actually from uh, uh, the Czechoslovakia in 1910 uh, and you see the typical uh, wagon, we are out in the middle of nowhere, Papa is playing the fiddle, Mama is smoking, yeah? also another stereotype, the children are singing, this is the merry life of the gypsies. Of course the real life of Roma and Sinti was not like this. Yeah? In Western Europe there were mostly regionally, uh, seasonally migrating Roma, actually mostly Sinti. And if you look at them, many of them were actually, uh, did look quite different. Yeah? And they were not so very poor. Yeah? So if you look at these pictures from 1920 from Halle in Germany, you will see that the car that these people are using to draw their wagons yeah, is a uh, Mercedes, yeah? which is not the cheapest of cars even in the 1920s. Yeah? So they were actually richer, many rich people among them. Here you have a photograph of a family called Bamberger. Uh, and I've added this because interestingly enough, many Sinti families were entrepreneurs and running cinemas in Germany in the 1920s. Or put it the other way around, a majority of cinemas in the 1920s were, was run by Sinti families. Yeah? So this is one of the branches where they were sort of employed. Or they were musicians. In every hotel between Istanbul and uh, the, uh, the Baltics you could find a Roma band of, of professional musicians who were learning their trade in high schools actually. So Roma were students of musical high schools since the 19th century. Yeah? Uh, in Eastern Europe the situation is completely different. Eastern Central Europe we have many poor Roma, <coughs> settled Roma. And here they are agricultural workers. Yeah? The major problem of the Roma of Central Europe is that they have no agricultural land. They live <coughs> in villages but they have no land. Eh? So they cannot grow potatoes eh? just to feed their children. There is, they have no wood to heat. They have to buy everything and if there is no money to steal everything. Eh? So that is the major problem. And you can see this village. So this is a, a Roma village from Burgenland. This is one from Slovakia, Central Slovakia. They're all around, somewhere in the 1920s. <coughs> and apart from working as harvesters, yeah, they do other jobs. This is, they make bricks. Yeah? Bricks from clay, or what in American English you call adobe. Yeah? All this, the, the population was not very big. Yeah? So, when we come to 1939, the Nazis counted the Roma population of the territory that they were sort of uh, occupying and they counted about 50,000 Roma. Yeah? So 0.07% of the population of the occupied, or Third Reich and occupied territories. 
So we are not talking about a big social question here. Yeah? But the approach of the Nazis towards the Roma was actually ideologically and racially motivated. Uh, there are several factors which will determine the persecution of Roma and Sinti. Uh, but some of these factors are already present before the Nazis come to power. And one of them is registration. The first one is the stereotypical representation. There is a strong stereotype and prejudice against Roma. The second is here registration. Registration of Roma starts in 1913. So, just about 100 years ago, when French start to issue special identification papers for non-residents, which is called gens de voyage, people who are traveling, for traveling people. Yeah? And uh, at, you must remember that at this time, virtually nobody has a passport. Yeah? So, the interesting thing is that about the eight, up till 1880, you could travel completely freely in Europe. Huh? Could go wherever you wanted. Nobody asked you. Huh? If you bought a house, you probably became a citizen of this place. There was no such a thing really as citizenship. Nobody asked you there. Yeah? And there were no passports. This is changing at the end of the 19th century. And by 1912, people start to get registered. Yeah? Because, first of all, the First World War is coming, arms, armies, are, armies are being drafted again, yeah? and social welfare systems are being developed. And if you want to get social welfare, you have to be a resident. Yeah? And now people, we, we have this question of uh, citizenship. If you see, you have uh, a photograph and you have fingerprints. Yeah? So, and, and it was, of course, introduced for the dubious elements of society, these gens de voyage that you could not trust. A yeah? hundred years later, we all have a document like this, yeah? with our fingerprints and with the photograph. Uh, but actually, it was introduced for the dubious elements of society. So maybe our governments don't trust anybody anymore, I don't know. Yeah? Uh, anyway, this idea of registering the Roma is spreading throughout Europe, through an institution called Interpol. Yeah? Interpol, that is the society for the, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, organization of police work on a European level. And now all these countries get uh, such gypsy registration cards. This one is from Hungary. There is one from the Czech Republic. You can see it here. Uh, there is a, sorry, from the Czechoslovak Republic. Uh, uh, this is a fingerprinting card from Austria. So, uh, and also the communities start to register their, their Roma. Yeah? Interpol, in 90, founded in 1923, is sort of pushing this policy that, so that what we have here is that by the end of the 30s there is, the Roma population is actually registered. So if you are unfortunate enough to be registered as a gypsy in the 1920s and 30s, you will be deported by the Nazis in the 30s, late 30s and early 40s. This is a general rule, so to say. If you are not registered, if you are happy, you will probably not be deported. Yeah? Uh, what we know about the Roma, and this we must also remember, we know basically from these photographs. And most of the photographs of the Roma that we have were actually made by the police in the 1920s and 30s. <coughs> you cannot see it here so clearly, but there is a policeman standing here. Can you see him? Yeah, so all, most of the photographs that we have were made during so-called police razzias in Roma settlements. This is also the reason why these people are standing like this yeah, in front of the houses. The police wanted to see who is living in these houses. So through this 
uh, stylistical elements, you can recognize police photography. Yeah? Police photography. Uh, you see some Roma who are actually producing this furniture, and if you look, the second figure from the right, can you see him? The policeman in the background. Yeah? Uh, during a police razzia. Yeah? Control. Now, this, again, a police photograph, yeah? and all the people lined up so that you, you know who belongs to which house. These pictures were then collected and used as illustration materials in journals of the uh, criminal police, and they were, of course, not made to record the life of the Roma. They were made to record the difficult work of the police with the Roma, yeah? and publish them in these journals of the criminal police. If we look at photographs that were made by amateurs, yeah? not police, we get a little bit of a different picture. I show you here. This is the photographer who made these pictures in the 1930s in the region of Burgenland along the Hungarian border. He is a photographer from Graz. These are his pictures and you see a little, you get a little bit of a different impression here. Yeah? And if we look at family photographs of Roma families for which they paid themselves, we find pictures that we might find in our family albums of our grandparents and great-grandparents of that period, actually. So self-representation and representation by the police are two completely different things here again. Yeah? So we have stereotyping, registration. The third element is eugenics. Eugenics is a kind, today regarded as a kind of pseudoscience, but at the time, the first half of the 20th century, everybody thought that it was sort of state of the art. Yeah? Eugenics is the belief that social behavior is not culturally determined, but it, it is in your genes. Yeah? And it actually came from America and then spreads all over Europe and uh, is actually responsible for this idea also that Hitler later grabbed up, you know, that Jews sort of have an inherited kind of behavior towards non-Jews, and the Roma also have a kind of inherited tendency towards criminality, yeah, towards crime. Yeah. So this was actually put forward by a Swiss doctor, Josef Jörger. He was the first one to try to prove yeah, that through an intermarriage, between a man from a traveling family and a woman from a peasant family, all the descendants became either criminals or prostitutes. Yeah? So moving about, being a traveler, was actually an indicator for this weakness in your genes. Yeah? So eugenics. And this ends up in the Nazi laws, law for the prevention of genetically diseased offspring is one of the first laws that the Nazis passed in 1933. And later on in 1935, the famous Nuremberg laws that you probably know about. Yeah? And the Nuremberg laws were then actually applied to two groups only, to the Jews and to the Roma. Yeah? only to, to, to these two groups where the Nuremberg laws applied. And the thing is, not the Nazis invented that. And the person who drafted the Nuremberg laws is a doctor, is a psychologist from Switzerland, Ernst Rüding. Yeah? He's not a crazy Nazi, but he's actually a worldwide recognized psychologist from Switzerland. Yeah? And there is one man in the Nazi government who is putting these ideas of eugenics now uh, into practice. This is Dr. Robert Ritter. Are you, have you heard this? Have you come across this name before? Anybody? No. Okay, Dr. Robert Ritter sets up a special office in what is called the Reichssicherheitshauptamt. There's a nice German word for you, Reichssicherheitshauptamt. Uh, it is the chief Office for Security of the Reich. Yeah? 
RSHA and so to speak the, the central of uh, SS and uh, he starts now to draft, to set up files on the Roma, on the so-called gypsy population of the Reich. Yeah? In the end he will have 40,000 files and these files will some years later on be the basis of the persecution of a lot of people. Yeah? And you can see him here on a photograph uh, when he is putting together his files. He started out with, measure, you know, with anthropological measurements, measuring noses and ears and stuff like that, but soon realized that uh, you don't get very far with measuring noses. And then he started to draw family trees of many, many Roma families. Yeah? And now comes the, first, uh, the fourth factor towards Roma genocide, and this is the world economic crisis. The world economic crisis at the end of the 20s is catastrophic, especially for the Eastern European Roma. Yeah? Because the Eastern European Roma are, work, are working as agricultural workers in these villages during harvest time mostly. Yeah? Now when mass employment hits the big cities, many workers return to their places of origin, to the villages, yeah? and they push the local Roma off the labor market. You don't need them anymore during harvest. And they actually starve. Yeah? So you can see here photographs from these Roma villages in the early 30s. You yeah? can see the state of the houses, for example. A good indicator for poverty is child mortality. Child mortality means uh, death before the second year, so before a child reaches, uh, becomes two years of age. Child mortality in the Roma settlements of Central Europe is over 50 percent. Yeah? Nowadays it's 0.04 percent. Yeah? So four children out of a thousand today die before their second birthday. In the Roma settlements of Central Europe, every second child died before its second birthday. These populations were basically starving. Yeah? Now, the fifth element here is, which really creates the problem, is there is an inefficient social welfare system. Because there was no really working welfare system. It was always the community who was responsible for the poor. Yeah? And now, you have, now we have this problem. A small village of a couple of hundred farmers is all of a sudden responsible for a group of 100, 150 Roma who have nothing to eat. Uh, you have to pay for their schooling, of course, because at the time there was no, mostly no national school system. Yeah? They become a big burden for the places that they are living in. And so in 1933, the first gypsy conference is uh, called in a small town in Austria, in Oberwart, on 15th of January 1933. Here you see the members of this conference inspecting the local Roma settlement of Oberwart. Yeah? And the members here already discuss, now we are talking about democratically elected politicians, yeah? they discuss what to do with the Roma. Ah, we could do like the Americans, we create a kind of reservation for them, or we could uh, send them to an island in the Atlantic Ocean, the famous Madagascar plan, yeah? uh, or put them all in jail, yeah? or the workhouse, or, says one of the participants, since we cannot kill them, we must find another solution. Yeah? It is formulated in the negative, but the idea is already there, yeah? killing them. It's already being formulated. And this is actually what the Nazis do. The Nazis add to these factors two new ones. Racist theory. The Nazis are prepared to carry out this racist policy, this very radical racist policy. Yeah? They really will segregate the people, they really will put them into camps and they really will kill them if they have to. Yeah? And there is a second element, it's so-called crime prevention. Yeah? Crime prevention, the word itself, is a Nazi invention actually. <clears throat> but they did not mean 
the securing of windows and doors. If you are convinced that people are born criminals because it's in their genes, yeah, then it makes no sense to wait till the crime is committed. Yeah? Why not lock up the person beforehand? Yeah? This is what crime prevention means. Yeah? This, and in this, <coughs> in this perspective, it makes sense to lock up children because they will grow into criminals. Yeah? And this is what the Nazis will do. Uh, the Nazis did not invent camps for Romas either. So all these elements were there. The first camps for Roma were actually set up in Switzerland in 1913. Switzerland banned all Roma from its territory before the First World War, right till 1984. Till 1984, every customs officer of Switzerland had the right to not let you into the country if he thought that you were a gypsy. Yeah? And, the peop and the Roma that were caught in Switzerland were put into this camp in Witzville. And another one, also during the First World War 1914, was actually established in France during the First World War in Crest, where 200 Roma were locked up for four years during the whole period of the war. Frankfurt had a Zigeuner Konzentrationslager actually in 1923, the city of Frankfurt, and the most. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so that, well, okay. So camps is nothing new either. Yeah? What is happening when the Nazis come to power is actually that the Roma yeah, lose all their rights immediately. So loss of constitutional rights, loss of legal protection. They become victims of arbitrary harassment by right-wing groups, by economic pressure groups, by local authorities and by state authorities. Yeah? If you are declared a gypsy, ev everybody can do with you what they want. And this is what happens actually. This is a photograph of the Olympics yeah? in Berlin in 1936. Olympic Games were organized by Berlin as a showcase to the world what the Nazi state could do. During the Olympics, all Sint and Roma living in Berlin were forced to live in camp in Berlin Marzahn yeah, in the north. And now they really had to live in wagons because they didn't, most of them had not been living in wagons. Yeah? And they were locked up here. They could only leave it if they had a permit of work. And because it worked so well, they were kept in this camp till their deportation to Auschwitz in 1943. Yeah? So this local administrators set up camps. So you will see that in many cases there is one structural difference between the persecution of Jews and Roma. The Jews are, as a rule, persecuted by the Gestapo. The Gestapo is responsible for the persecution of Jews. We can see that the persecution of Roma is usually done by the criminal police and by the social authorities. It is usually the social authorities who start the persecution, who start the camps, who pay for the deportations even. Yeah? Will become a little bit, will become more important uh, for the research later on. So when we come to the deportations, which, is, which are now happening slowly, we have this fatal spiral of rising costs of social welfare. What does this mean? When the Nazis come to power, they start to put Roma into camps and they start to deport Roma to labor camps as forced labor. Now, and this turns out to be counterproductive because the people that they deport to labor camps are the ones who are actually able to work and earn money. Yeah? So the, the communities were complaining, we have to pay so much for the Roma population. Now, some of them are being deported, but the ones that are deported are the ones who are able to work. Now, there is even less money coming into the Roma community. The, the political community, the, the towns and cities have to pay even more. So they, so they shout even louder for deportation. More people are being deported and the city has to pay even more because only the children and the old are left. Yeah? 
So it doesn't work. And just to prove my point, the villages here, you have a list from a village in Austria, they knew exactly where the people had been deported to. Yeah? It's not a big mystery. And they knew, so here, here you can see Roma deported to Dachau in 1939, the man here to Ravensbrück in northern Germany, a concentration camp for women. And here you have the statement of an Austrian politician who says, because of the recent deportation into work camps of all male gypsies who are able to work, the number of gypsy family members who need social assistance has risen dramatically. Since through this action, nearly all gypsy families have been robbed of their breadwinner. Around 2,000 gypsies, grown-ups, women and children have become dependent on social aid. The deportation has actually achieved the exact opposite of its original intention. Yeah? So the problem here that the social services are being faced with, they have created themselves through the first deportations. Yeah? Uh, so the first deportations of Roma start in 1940 when 2,500 Sinti and Roma from Germany are being deported to Pol what is today Poland, to the Generalgouvernement, a place called Belzec, in 1940. It is not identical with the later extermination camp for Jews in the same place. Yeah? These people, as you can see, when they come to Belzec, there is nothing. Yeah? They have to build their own camp, and most of them flee in the winter. Some of them even manage to go back to Germany. Uh, they do not stay here in this place. And also the authorities of this, what is called General Gouvernement, General Government of occupied Polish territory, uh, do not want these gypsies which are being deported from Poland. So at home, within the Third Reich, in order to solve this question that has been created through the deportation into work camps, now so-called collection camps are being set up. The largest collection camp uh, was Lackenbach in what is nowadays Austria. It, is, it was the largest Roma or Gypsy camp in, on the territory of the Third Reich created in 1940, and you see a photograph of its opening day. Yeah? Uh, similar camps were here in the Czech Republic as well. Uh, one was in Leti. You, have probably, you are probably familiar with these discussions about the pig farm on the site of the former camp in Leti, Upisku, I think it's called. And there was a second one, which is Hodonin, but it, it's not the Hodonin in the south, it's Hodonin na Kunstadt, or is that it, or near Kunstadt. Yeah? So it's north of, north of Bruno, yeah? small, a very small village. Uh, there were two camps like this. In this camp, there were more than 4,000 prisoners. Yeah? And from here, they are being deported then. Th th we have some photographs of this camp. The property of the people who were deported here was confiscated. The money was given to the camp administration to pay for the camp. So it was actually the prisoners themselves had to pay for their imprisonment. Yeah? Their property is being sold off. Their houses, their wagons, everything that they have is being sold off. The money is given to the camp administration to pay for it. The camp is not created by the SS or the SR. The camp is created by the social services. The social services of four districts put together money and they, they bring about, they create this camp. Yeah? Uh, and from here, the first deportation start, again paid for by the social services. And the first big group of 5,000 Roma from Austria are now deported to a Jewish ghetto in Poland in 1941. Why? We don't know. Yeah? There was a big deportation of Austrian and German Jews to this Jewish ghetto in Wuj, Lodz, as it's called in German, Wuj in Polish, yeah? had a big ghetto of 110,000 Jews. Now there's another 20,000 being deported there and 5,000 Roma. Of these 5,000 Roma uh, from Austria, 
11 are dead on arrival. Yeah, they don't survive the transport. Uh, they are being put into five houses. The houses are still standing. We can see them like this today. 40 people to a room. Most of these people here on this transport are the, are the people we've been talking about. 60% of them are children under 12. You know, their, their parents had been deported in 39 and 40 to the labor camps. The children and the old were left. They are being deported here. 12, 60% uh, of them are under 12 years old. Most of the rest are rather old, over 60. Yeah? They are put into this camp. It's November, very badly organized, very little food, typhoid fever breaks out. In the next three weeks, 640 of them die and they are being buried in a mass grave on the Jewish cemetery of Wuj. And then the camp commander, the Nazi camp commander, catches typhoid fever and dies. And then the Nazi administration of the city says, okay, too risky, we kill them all. And they are being taken 100 kilometers on to an extermination camp, Chelmno, in German Kulmhof, Chelmno nad Nerem. Yeah? And there they are being gassed or shot, it's not so clear, in the woods. No survivors whatsoever. So by the beginning of 1942, all, all people of this transport are dead and it's the largest mass grave of Roma in, uh, uh, during, the, during the Roma genocide. The big deportations, the final deportations then uh, to Auschwitz in 1943 are based on a general decision by Himmler on the 16th of December 1943, he signs the so-called Auschwitz Decree, Zigeuner Erlass, and from then on, from the beginning of 1943, and here the Czech Roma from Leti are actually among the first groups being de deported to, to Auschwitz in, in uh, I think, February 1943, and from, <coughs> from all over these territories, more than 23,000 Roma are being deported to a camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau, B2E. And here is one of the very few photographs actually from the Roma camp. Yeah? What you see is the inside of the barracks. And this, this funny thing here, this is a chimney. Yeah? Uh, you can see the chimney going up. But first it goes along the ground. And here was an oven. Yeah? And so this, this big chimney was constructed to heat. That was the only heating that there was. Yeah? And here in winter, the Roma put their wet clothes onto this uh, uh, bank here of the chimney to dry their clothes. This is what you see here. Yeah? Uh, out of the 23,000, one year later, in 1944, in the, in the spring of 1944, about 7,000 are still alive. So two-thirds die within a year, yeah? just of the horrible conditions here. And in, when, the, when the Allied armies are approaching already in the summer of 1944, yeah? in August, uh, the people who are still able to work in Auschwitz are being selected, also the Roma, and they are being brought back to Germany as slave labor. And out of this, still, the people still alive, about 3,600 are selected, and they are marched, they have to walk, yeah, back into Germany. These are the so-called death marches, yeah, Todesmärsche in German, death marches. And the remaining, 2,980 something, no, so nearly 3,000 are being gassed on the night from the 2nd to the 3rd of August in Auschwitz. And that is the end of the death camp in Auschwitz. And it is also the reason why on the 2nd of August today, the international Roma community is meeting in Auschwitz yeah, in a commemoration event for their dead in Auschwitz. Yeah, so this is the big event in Auschwitz of the Roma community. I have two more photographs to show you. This is a photograph of a Roma family from Austria, from a small village called Klein Petersdorf, which had actually two Roma families. Yeah? 
they are related. One of them is the blacksmith of the village and the other one is his brother-in-law with his family who is an agricultural worker. In 1943, uh, the police comes and says, okay, we, we, the, the gypsies are being taken away to Auschwitz. And the mayor of the place says, wait, 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 this is a farming village. Yeah? We need the blacksmith. He cannot go, we, we, we can't exist without him. So the blacksmith stays with his whole family and nothing happens. Yeah? His brother-in-law with the whole family is taken to Auschwitz and they all perish. Yeah? And nothing, so nothing happens to this mayor. Yeah? And you, you can see what we see in the historical sources over and over again. Deportations without the support of the local population cannot happen. They us it's, imp it's impossible, usually it doesn't happen. We also see from it that if people resisted the Nazi authorities, not a lot happened to them actually. So, this man, Geza de Ronzi, is an aristocrat. He owns a big tract of land yeah, on the Austrian-Hungarian border and he employs a lot of Roma from this one camp, Lackenbach. He gets them out of the camp and he says, I need them as workers on, the, on, on my lands. These lands are very close to the Hungarian border and he lets them escape. He saved more than 200 people. Nothing ever happened to him. Yeah? Nobody ever blamed him. Yeah? So it's not true that it was so deadly, deadly dangerous to help people at the time. I come back to this photograph of these children that you've seen before. None of these children, we know this for certain, none of these children have survived the year 1941. Yeah? We, we saw the photograph a little bit earlier. And I finish with this one, the girl with the headscarf. This photograph was taken in uh, 1943 when the deportations from uh, Holland, from Camp Westerborg, left for Auschwitz. Huh? And a girl, in the last moment, a girl is looking out of the wagon before the door is closed. And this photograph, it's out of a film actually. Huh? It was filmed. And this photograph, after 1945, was in every history school book of Belgium, Holland, and some of Germany, as a symbol for the suffering of the Jewish people. And it was called the girl with the headscarf, just before deportation. In 2006, a journalist from Holland discovered that this girl was actually not a Jewish girl. It was a Sinti girl, a girl from a Sinti family, Settela Steinbach. Yeah? And I think I've put it here because for many, many years after the war, nobody wanted to know about the deportation of the Roma. The topic was completely neglected. Research only started in earnest in the 1980s. Yeah? So, whereas the lists of Jewish victims of the Holocaust has already been drawn up in the 1940s, this did not happen for Roma and Sinti victims. So this is why we have a big problem today, from a distance of more than 70 years, to reconstruct the deportations. Yeah? and also why there is this big dispute about the numbers of victims, as you've probably heard. Yeah? Some Roma historians claim that there were more than two million, others say no, there were may only 120,000. Uh, the number that is usually mentioned is up to 500,000. 500,000 is an old guess, an inspired guess, I think we must say, that there is many areas, like the Balkans, where we don't know how many victims there were. Most parts of occupied Russia, we have very little data. So 500,000 is probably close to the truth. Two million is an absolute uh, exaggeration and there is no basis for this. Yeah? yeah, and I would finish with this and I think then there is still time for some questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Please. Speak about the Sinti Roma. Yeah. For example, my first year in the, the university, 
I remember we were in the class speaking about social work in the Czech Republic and some students uh, was, weren't comfortable about this discussion about Roma and Gypsy and some students from Germany. Mm -hmm. However, I, I lived in the Balkans before, mm -hmm. you know, Bulgaria in particular, and uh -huh. I lived in a semi-Gypsy uh, street. Mm -hmm. But my question today is, uh, what's the recent um, psychological state of the average Roma in the sense that a lot of welfare is you know, involved in helping them, housing, but the Roma themselves, how eager are they to change this stereotype and make a rebrand? Okay. Thank you. Somebody else, or uh, shall we collect, or shall I just answer? Simon, what, what do you say? Okay. Uh, well, now, this is a, not so much a historical question, but a political question. Um, I say, if you ask me, I think that most of the Roma will grab the chance to, uh, what do you call it, assimilate yeah? and lead a normal life if they have it. That is my experience. Yeah? So I, I think I know for a fact that very few people like to live in poverty and like to live in bad housing. Yeah? Uh, if there is a real chance to get out of this misery situation, people will usually take it. Yeah? Uh, I've said this, it is one of my pet topics. Yeah? Uh, there is some research uh, funded by the United Nations Development Program, it was seven years ago probably, uh, done by sociologists in the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria, but Bulgaria is a little bit of an exception here because the Roma are especially segregated in Bulgaria. Uh, what these soci sociologists did is they tried to find people who identified themselves as Roma. Yeah? And then they spoke with the so-called social experts in this area. So with teachers, policemen, public administrators, social workers, who are the Roma yeah? in your village, town, etc. The interesting thing is, that the overlap is only 50% in all the other, all the other countries. Yeah? It's higher in Bulgaria because the regions or the streets or the districts where they live are so clearly marked. Yeah? It's only 50%. So 50% of the people who declare themselves to be Roma are not recognized as Roma yeah? because they are mostly not so poor yeah? and because they live like anybody else and 50% of whom the social experts think that they are Roma, they are just poor. Yeah? So here we have a kind of ethnification of poverty in Eastern Europe that is going on. Yeah? And I think, first of all, that this is a little bit of an explanation why right-wing parties yeah, become so popular, because if you are already threatened yeah, by poverty and you are sliding down the economic scale, and now you are always in danger of being identified with a completely uh, discriminated group, yeah? so that you will be seen as a Roma. How do you prove that you are not a gypsy? By joining the party which is, most, which is the most fervent anti-gypsy party. Yeah? I think that phenomena like Jobbik in Hungary and other parties can, to a certain extent, be explained with that. Yeah? Uh, as I said, uh, we have an interesting phenomenon in Austria. Austria has many faults in itself. Uh, its current Roma policy is not among it, I must say. Yeah? I don't say that Austrians don't have any prejudices yeah, against Roma. So in 90% of the cases, if you came home and said, my boyfriend is of Roma origin or my girlfriend, there would be problems in the family because there is lots of prejudices. Yeah? Uh, but on an institutional level, you don't, we don't have it in this way. Yeah? 
This has to do with the fact that in 1995 there was a bomb attack on the Roma community and four people were killed. This was the first political murder in Austria since 1945. Yeah? Uh, there was a big wave of solidarity. The president, the, uh, the federal government, the local government, 10,000 people came to the funeral. Yeah? Uh, and there is a lot, there was a wave of, of, call it sympathy, towards the Austrian Roma. And we have lots of Roma that came into Austria, mainly from the Balkans, with the so-called guest worker migration, yeah? since the 1960s and 70s, from former Yugoslavia. Yeah? And they are, I'm not saying that the Austrians love their guest workers. Yeah? They actually discriminate them. But we don't have a Roma category. We have the category of guest worker, yeah? which is lower middle class or working class. And we, we have only one differentiation, which is Turks and what we call Yugos yeah? from Yugoslavia. Yeah? But there is no way to, to see this. Yeah? They are economically completely integrated. There is no... Uh, they, they are working, it's on the lower end of the work scale, but they are working. Yeah? Uh, and uh, about two years ago, so they are not visible. Yeah? Also not visible as a social group also. Yeah? So I think if, if you have the chance to integrate economically and socially, usually people will take this chance. Yeah? Uh, two years ago, an ethnologic, uh, a student of es uh, anthropology, et ethnology actually, uh, did a paper on uh, wedding ceremonies in a small town in uh, Lower Austria, north of Vienna. Uh, 5,000 inhabitants, that city is called Horn. Yeah? And she discovered that every year or every second year there is a wedding with 600 people, yeah? which is not normal in Austria. Yeah? And then when she tried to find out why this was, she discovered that there was a whole village of Bosnian Roma that in the last 15 years had relocated to this town of Horn and the neighboring villages. And when they were having a, a, a wedding, then everybody from this community was invited and they rented one of these big factory uh, halls and had the big wedding. But apart from that, the fact that this migration had taken place was not visible. Yeah? So in answer to your question, I think it is possible. So apparently these people who cannot be integrated in uh, Hungary and Bulgaria or I don't know where, when they cross the Austrian uh, border, they, be, they somehow change yeah? and they can be integrated. I think it has to do a little bit with opportunities if you give people the chance to do this yeah? uh, also. Yeah? I'm not saying it's easy and it's uh, probably difficult because the, the more, the poorer people get, the, uh, there is a, a, the daily life is falling apart, uh, moral standards are sinking, there is problems of alcoholism, drugs, etc. Everything that goes with poverty. Yeah? And it does not help to increase, uh, to, to, to make the situation better. Please. No, I, I'm here. Okay, um, you have a no? Okay, I have a question. Um, why do you think that the theme of romance in the Holocaust was abandoned until, as you say, the 1980s? Was it by um, less of the UN than the Jewish Holocaust? No, and Frank Diary? Or oh, what was the main reason? Because the massive amount of people died. Thank you. Uh, Well, uh, first of all, I think we have to say that also the topic of the Holocaust was not very popular. Yeah? So right after the war, right into the 60s, nobody was very keen to speak about the Holocaust either. Not, not only the perpetrators were not, of course, but also among the victims. Yeah? The, the Holocaust was not actually a topic that many wanted to raise. Also, the state of Israel was not very interested in, 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 in dealing with the question of the Holocaust. Yeah? And certainly not with the question of uh, restitution yeah, on an uh, individual scale. Yeah? 
Israel preferred institution on a bilateral uh, level. Yeah? So basically till the 1960s nobody was very keen. Some Roma were trying to get restitution yeah, in the 50s, but it soon turned out that they were denied this. This has, had also to do with the fact that of the camp, the, the camp survivors and the organizations of the camp survivors in the first decades were, at least in Austria and Germany, as far as I can see, dominated by the former political yeah, uh, victims. Yeah? And they did not or were not very keen yeah, to get recognition for the racially persecuted, certainly not for the Roma, because they shared all the prejudices against the Roma. Yeah? And they usually said the Roma were put into concentration camps because they didn't want to work. Yeah? So they shared these prejudices. And we can see that, for example, in the 50s yeah, or in the late 40s, early 50s, many Roma write down yeah, their experiences in the camps because they think that they will get recognition and maybe get compensation payments. And when they realize that this is not going to happen, they stop. Yeah? Nowadays, we discover that it's not true that nobody was talking about it. Actually, the Roma, the survivors were talking about it in the 50s, but nobody wanted to listen. Yeah? Uh, and it takes quite long. Uh, and uh, probably a factor is that in the 1970s, the first international body of Roma organization is founded. You have the first Roma conference in, in, uh, outside of London. The interesting thing is that it was funded by the World Council of Churches. Yeah? They funded it, uh, gave the money. Yeah? And there also, there you have the decision on the Roma flag, you know this, uh, you're probably familiar with the Roma flag. Uh, uh, the, the, I, I can show you, okay, with the Roma anthem. Yeah? This, there's a song called Jelem Jelem. This is the inofficial uh, uh, anthem. Yeah? And this gives a kind of impetus. Yeah? This kicks off a development. Also, you have a generation change. Yeah? So now the people who had been in, in the camps have already grown up children, and these children are being politicized in the 1960s and 70s, which is a time of heavy student unrest in Europe. Yeah? The 68 movement in Western Europe is the kind of wild student mobilization. Yeah? So the new generation comes out of this new understanding of democratic rights, which their parents did not have. Yeah? And, and the, one of the first events, which is very typical, is that somebody like Romani Rose, who is the head of the German uh, uh, organization of Sinti, state organization of Sinti and Roma, typically the son of a survivor. Yeah? He decides in 1981, when he, when he realizes that the German police is still using the same cartothek of Roma that they used to deport the people, yeah? and that some of the police officers are actually still working there, yeah? that they organize a hunger strike in uh, Dachau. Yeah? The 20 survivors under the leadership of Romani Rose and some youngers uh, occupy actually the Protestant church, but there is a Protestant pr uh, place of prayer in Dachau, and they go in there, they lie down on camp beds, and they start a hunger strike for two weeks, and then the police gives up all its materials and hands them over to the uh, university for research. Yeah? And this is, this is when uh, real scientific research actually starts in the late 1970s, early 80s, from then on. Yeah? But it needs this kind of little push, and uh, yeah, with, there is a delay. But I think these are the two factors yeah, that uh, influence that. Like, 
And if you can play the strong mass like with the homogeneous group or not actually. It's a little okay, it's it's a little bit like with the uh, Bohemians and the Moravians, you know. Yeah? Do they actually speak the same language in everyday life? Uh, yes, uh, not always. Yeah? There, are, there are dialects, uh, yes. Uh, it's the same with the Roma. Yeah? Basically, and they are completely right, they are... Uh, and today there are many Roma who don't speak any Roma languages at all. Yeah? So I would say that among the, 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 the funny thing is we have, it's a big language group. Yeah? So how many Roma are there? Good question, we don't know. Yeah? Nobody knows. <coughs> we have this phenomenon that the Roma are, <coughs> in the European statistics, the Roma are growing like rabbits. Yeah? So, in, 90, in, 19, uh, in 2004, the estimate of the Roma NGOs was 4 million point five. Ten years later, it's 14 million. Yeah? This is completely impossible. Yeah? So nobody, no, no group can grow like this. Yeah? And, but, and this has a political reason. Yeah? I think that here, we have a situation where the Roma NGOs and the Eastern European or Central European governments, where these figures come from, yeah, are both interested in increasing the number of Roma. Yeah? Why? Because the NGOs, the more people they represent, the more important they become. The governments, because the more Roma they have, the more money they get from Brussels for their uh, policy programs. Yeah? So you have a win-win situation yeah, where you sort of raise the number of Roma. Actually, it's very difficult. Who, who is the Roma? The people who declare themselves to be Roma in a census? That's not even a million in Europe. So, this is very tricky. Question of languages. There is different groups of languages. In, you have the Western languages, which is Sinti, and Manouche and some subgroups, but these are languages strongly influenced by German mostly. Yeah? In Spain, there is a different language actually strongly influenced by Spanish, yeah? which has been spoken there for over 600 years. In Eastern Europe, we have two big groups. The one is influenced by the Romanian language, and these, these languages are called Vlach, yeah? Vlach Roma. Actually, there is a big Roma community which speaks an old variety of Romanian and not uh, Romani at all, yeah? but a, a, a kind of 17th century Romanian. Yeah? And you have the non-Vlach, which are basically influenced by Albanian. Yeah? Uh, do, this, do these people all understand each other? Yes and no. Most of these languages have only been lexicalized yeah? in the last 15 to 20 years. But an interesting thing is happening. First of all, the common core of these languages is so strong that people can communicate with each other. Yeah? And internet yeah, actually has a very strong effect. There is lots of people who use internet and communicate in Roman or Romani or Romanes in the internet. Yeah? are creating a new kind of international standard in Romani. This is one of the gurus of, of uh, Roma linguistics, Jaron Matras from the University of Manchester claims. He says, what we see at the moment is that among young Roma, a new international standard is evolving. Yeah? Where these Roma communities probably, he thinks, will end up in having a kind of standardized Roma yeah, in maybe 10, 10 15 years yeah, that will be understood, written yeah, and read by a big community of educated Roma. Yeah. The language groups are very much different, but this is the same. Are Austrians German? Do we speak German? Yeah. Do the, if somebody from Hamburg came to Vienna he would not understand anything. Yeah? And if I went to Hamburg, I would understand only half what these people are talking. 
although we all listen to the same kind of news yeah, in the television. Yeah? So what the Roma at the moment are lacking is not a common language. What they, what they are lacking at the moment is a common standardized version of different Roma dialects. Yeah? Is there a Roma identity? Same answer from me, but it would be better to ask Roma actually. Yeah? Uh, I think that in many Roma there is something like a feeling that yes, we belong yeah, together in a certain way. Yeah? This is growing. It's growing actually fast and I think it's stronger now than it has ever been before. I think that the Roma groups at the beginning of the 20th century had a very less of a common Roma identity. Yeah? The, the, the identity of these subgroups. Yeah? which is sometimes based on, on, uh, on professions. Yeah? Aurari, Ursari, people who used to be gold washers and people who used to present dancing bears, stuff like that. Yeah? Uh, Lovari, the horse sellers, etc. That was very strong, but today, uh, to a certain extent, yes. Also, also there is a hierarchy. Yeah? Sinti of Western Europe are very much concerned with uh, taboos yeah? and more concerned than they were 50 years ago. There is a re-fundamentalization yeah? also with the Roma, also with many religious groups, but also with the Roma. Yeah? Many, I think I know a lot of Sinti who would not, I think, eat at the house of an Eastern European Roma because they are ritually not clean. Yeah? Or if you go to Finland, the Finnish Roma, whew, the you know, this is the Salafists of the Roma movement, yeah, so to speak. Yeah? Very, very strict on the behavior of women and men, and uh, uh, a, man cannot, uh, a woman cannot sleep on the second floor of the hotel if a, uh, if a Rom is sleeping on the first floor because the woman is not allowed to be above the man or something like that. So it's, it's, uh, and it's new, it was not there 50 years ago. Yeah? Something new is evolving whether there is something like what is called the Romani pen, yeah? so this, uh, uh, an essential Romaness, which some people try to write about. I, I doubt it, but you have to ask the Roma, I don't know. Yeah? I'm, I'm not a Rom, so I, I think I'm not, uh, I should not speak about it. So you, you say, if most of them were settled, why is the stereotype the traveling Roma? Exactly. Yeah? Okay, well, uh, okay. My attempt at an explanation for this yeah, is, as I said, the rise of mass media. Yeah? Photography playing a big role and then uh, more, and, more and more mass media, basically. Creating this image, yeah, which does it is it, it, an invented tradition. Yeah? Uh, are you, you are probably familiar with this term of invented tradition. Yeah? Uh, there is a very good book by Terence Hill and... Uh, oh, no. I forget the name. Hill and Ranger. Yeah? Uh, and... Uh, no, oh, sorry. Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger. Yeah? Uh, about invented tradition. And it is what happens to the Scots and it is what happens to the Norwegians, yeah? that in this period between 1860 and 1920, certain stereotypical pictures about European nations yeah? are established which have nothing to do with reality. If you look at a picture of a, a Viking, which you know with the horns, yeah? Uh, and everybody will tell you immediately, you know, this is a Viking, Vicky and the strong man from TV, yeah? 
And every Norwegian, when he goes to a hockey match, has this helm with the two horns. Yeah? But this is a complete invention. No helmet with two horns has ever been excavated. It is an invention of Wagnerian opera. Yeah? It was invented in Bayreuth, when the Valkyrie figures in the Wagner opera got a helmet with two horns. Yeah? And nowadays we are all convinced that the old Scandinavians were running around with helmets with two horns. It has nothing to do with reality. They are created through photography and mass media. The same is true for the Scottish kilt. Yeah? The Scottish kilt is invented by two, how to say, uh, 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 funny and very gifted uh, uh, aristocrats and the British uh, textile industry. Yeah? And to, there is no proof that Scotsmen were wearing kilts before the 19th century to a large extent. Certainly there were no different kilts for different clans. This was invented in the late 19th century to make it easier for the textile industry. This region gets you know, this pattern and the other region gets this pattern and you have it's a quite good business. Yeah? And I think that something similar is happening with the Roma. Yeah? That this, this one picture, this stereotypical picture, is created and there is this support of uh, the strong romantic idea. And maybe there is a political factor in this. Yeah? Uh, there is two countries which have this very positive image of the Roma for a long, long time, and this is Hungary and Spain. In Spain, it's the flamenco. Yeah? This is the typical gypsy, it's either the flamenco player or it's the Hungarian fiddler. Yeah? And it has to do, in both cases, a little bit with the, with the failed revolutions of 1848, yeah? where uh, the Roma becomes something like a symbol for the whole nation. Yeah? Also, they, they are also the, the, how to say, the perpetual losers. Yeah? And they are, you know, laughing and crying is in one pocket, as we say. Yeah? Uh, and uh, for many, many years, if you asked somebody what is Hungarian music, everybody would have said gypsy music, yeah? Czardas. But Czardas is A, not the typical Hungarian music, yeah? and it's B, not a typical Roma music. It's a completely kind of invention of 19th century. Yeah? And uh, also this, the, this fake picture of what a Hungarian is, is also like an invented tradition. So I think this process of invented tradition and mass media is responsible for what we get here in this misrepresentation. This would be my way of explaining it. I want to make a comment on your previous explanation on the Roma identity. But, but I observed actually that uh, people do not call the Roma the Roma. But the Romans themselves say, oh, I'm gypsy. You know, so it's like they are uh, easy to identify with that. And also, in some places in Europe, we have uh, Roma parties, like in Turkey, in Bulgaria, we have Roma uh, parties. Roma parties. Yeah. Right. But my main question is actually, is there a Roma religion? Right, the reason why I'm saying this is because from your uh, introduction, the Roma migrated from the part of India, and we know India they have diversity in religion. So today we have Roma people in Albania, in Serbia, in Czech, some of them are Muslims, Christians, and whatsoever, but is there a Roma religion that's the form of also identity for the Roma people? Uh, it's true what you say. Many Roma refer to themselves as gypsies. Yeah? Uh, I usually do not. So when I use the word gypsy here in this kind of uh, lecture, I do it if the historical term was something to do with gypsies. Like it was called a gypsy camp. Yeah? Zigeuner Lager. It was not called Roma Lager. Yeah? Otherwise, I do not. The European Roma movement had one of its aims was to get rid of this very pejorative term Zigeuner. Yeah? They wanted to be called 
Sinti and Roma, Roma and Sinti. Yeah? I accept this. I think it's a sign of respect. Yeah? So if they, if they themselves want to call themselves gypsies, they can do so, why not? Yeah? Uh, I, out of respect for this development and for Roma movements, use the term Roma and Sinti. Uh, there are Roma parties, yes, in different uh, colors, actually. There have been Roma parties for a long time. The first one, I think, was founded in actually Romania in the 1920s. Not so very much successful, but it was there. There was an attempt. Yeah? Uh, we have it now. We have uh, Roma parties uh, uh, with a social democratic outlook. Uh, we have uh, Roma parties with a conservative outlook, yeah? like in Hungary. Yeah, Fidesz has a has a kind of Roma party which works together with Fidesz. It's there. Yeah? Uh, if you ask me if this is a good thing or not, I think uh, this is for the Roma actually to decide. What I find much more important is that we have more and more Roma as elected representatives of mainstream parties. Yeah? Of, and they can be conservative, and they can be communist, and they can be social democratic, and if they want to be, they can be neoliberal or whatever. Yeah? We, have a, we had a Roma candidate for the Austrian right-wing party. Yeah? Yes. Yeah? So I think this is, this is very important, and it has taken very long. So the, the first Rome in Austria to be elected into public office was in 1992, I think. Yeah? Before that, there was not a single Rome in an elected uh, position. Yeah? Today, we have Aus Roma as Austrian diplomats. Yeah? So, that is a big leap yeah? in 25 years. Yeah? This is, I think, the most important development. Roma religion. I would say no. So I can't see a Roma religion. Yeah? There is many Rom Roma are Muslims, they are Orthodox, they are Calvinist. Uh, probably there are some Lutherans, I don't know. Actually, I don't know one, but I know some Calvinists. There is lots and lots and lots of Catholics. Yeah? This varies from country to country. Uh, if there is something like a reinvention yeah, of a religion or a tradition based on, on a Indian uh, Hinduist maybe religion. Everything is possible, you know. Look at Jamaica and the Rastafaris. Yeah? The whole movement was invented by an African journalist in London. Yeah? The whole cult of the Lion of Zion was written up by a single person in the 1930s in London. Yeah? And nowadays there is thousands of people who believe in it. So, you know, as, as we say, a, a man's religion is his paradise. Yeah? So maybe the Roma will, will, will invent something like this. There is one phenomenon, though, which is very remarkable, that evangelical churches, especially from America, are very prominent among the Roma. Yeah? It's all kinds of evangelical churches. Yeah? Uh, Latter-day Saints, Mormons, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, all these small groups are everywhere all uh, around Europe and they are heavily recruiting and missionizing among the Roma. Why they are so successful is a good question. There is no good research into that as far as I can see. Yeah? My guess would be that there is an appeal because these small churches are actually very democratic in outlook. Yeah? They are not racist. Yeah? So if you accept the premises of this creed, they will treat you more or less as an equal. Yeah? This is one. And the second is that very often there is a, there is a combination of social economic inclusion. Yeah? So that access to some kind of work or workplaces is also um, yeah, combined with, with joining this group. Yeah?
Well, uh, I, I wanted to show you the flag. This is the flag yeah? uh, of the Roma movement. Yeah, this is the flag of the Roma movement. And uh, maybe, yes, you have another question. It's just a quick question. What does it symbolize? I mean, the green blue and the. the this is, this is the, the, the wheel that you find here is actually taken from the Indian flag. And, you know, it's, it's a wheel, so they thought it was good, yeah? Symbolizing the traveling. On the other hand, the wheel is a very strong symbol in Hinduism. And the blue and green, I don't know where they take it from. But in answer maybe to your question about this stereotyping, yeah? uh, I will show you these two pictures which I did not talk about. In 1990, you, you can hardly see it, yeah? Can, you, can we maybe just turn off the, the front lights a little bit? Yeah. In 1990, the United Nations issued a series of stamps yeah, symbolizing the, the, uh, the what is it called, the, the human rights. Yeah? And uh, it's uh, paragraph 11 is, everybody has the right to defend himself in front of an independent court. Yeah? Everybody who is accused of something has the right to defend himself in front of an independent court. And it was illustra illustrated with this picture yeah? from Hungary, from the National Gallery of Hungary. And it is called In Front of the Judge. Yeah? And you can see three Roma here. Can you, you see the three the Roma? And this is the judge, yeah? painted in the 18, late 1880s by a Hungarian painter. Now, funnily enough, this painting was painted for the Royal Palace of Budapest, therefore the documentation is very good. And we know from the painter that actually the three Roma who are standing here are not the accused. What the painter is painting here is three Roma and the one is holding a broken fiddle. Can you see that? Here, yeah? And the, the figure who is standing to the left of this, this farmer boy, he is the accused. The Roma accused the boy that he has, when he was drunk, broken the fiddle of the Roma musicians. Yeah? So they are not the accused. They are the accusers. But a hundred years later, we automatically read this painting that three Roma before a judge can only be the accused. Yeah? The narrative for us is so strong that we automatically use it as an illustration for the right to appear to defend yourself in front of an independent judge. Even the weakest elements of society have the right to defend themselves in front of an independent judge. And this is what, what these strong narratives that mass media sort of transports yeah? uh, make us see our, our perception yeah? is influenced by this narrative so strong that we reinterpret what we see in a, in a different way. Did I answer your question? Okay, good. Okay, so. <clears throat> thank you, yeah, thank you. I, I, I have exhausted you, I think. I've, I've spoken so long. Thank you very much.